Here we are on the home stretch. Week six is already here. As I forecasted last week, we might be forgiven for wondering if there's any such thing as knowledge at all. Is it any wonder that Pilate washed his hands at Jesus' trial and in exasperation said, What is truth? In fact, this is a tool of cynical politicians. In his novel 1984, George Orwell describes the perfect dystopia, where the party has caused confusion and misdirection through a program designed to confuse the people. War is peace. Freedom is slavery. Ignorance is strength. Is this the case? Is it impossible to know anything? Are we left in a soup of confusion and subjectivity? I think you and I can agree that this is not the case. Have you ever driven through a busy metropolitan city and noticed how absurd it is that we all drive 60 miles an hour with our bumpers only a few feet from one another? Hundreds of cars on the road, all obeying rules, and somehow big pileup accidents are rare. They happen, but they are the exception. I know at some level that my fellow drivers on the road are going to follow a predictable pattern of behavior, and it's not until some idiot driver decides to violate those expectations and rules that I'm even aware of those assumptions. I frequently hop inside of a tube with a hundred other strangers, and we let another complete stranger drive that tube with speed so great it causes that tube to fly in the air. I act as though I expect to get to Lima, as do all the other passengers, even though I have not inspected the plane myself or even interviewed the pilot to ensure she knows how to fly this thing. In other words, I make decisions all the time based upon assuming that certain beliefs are true. The criteria for justification are reliable enough for me to risk hurling through the atmosphere or flying down the expressway. There may be exceptions, but I know that for the most part flying is safe. There may be exceptions, but I know that most drivers will predictably follow the rules of the road. One of the ways we do this form of knowledge creation is to weigh the preponderance of evidence. I've never known a person who was involved in a plane crash. I've driven hundreds of thousands of hours and witnessed only a couple of major accidents. Those who argue that climate change is a major concern will argue that the preponderance of the studies, more than 97%, show evidence that the Earth's global temperature is on the rise. We rely upon preponderance as a way of establishing what we know. Another means of testing criteria of justification is through the measurement of observation. This is what empirical research refers to, some effort to carefully measure an observation or experience. At sea level, water consistently boils in an open beaker at 100 degrees Celsius. We can measure this observation over and again and find the same measurement to be true. As a result, we grow to believe that the consistency of measurement justifies the belief that the boiling point of water is true. In 1796, Edward Jenner discovered that milkmaids were not getting the deadly smallpox infection. Interestingly, they were getting the cowpox infection, a similar but benign infection. Through a series of tests and observations, Jenner discovered that we could inoculate people against smallpox by infecting them with cowpox. This observation was so reliable that smallpox has been eradicated from the planet. It no longer exists. The scientific method is also used to describe human behavior as well. The intelligence quotient is a measure of intelligence that uses large samples to describe the ability to perform different cognitive functions. There are other tools as well, like those that measure language development or depression, or as we saw with Bob in week three, the kinds of skills a person naturally does best. Human behavior is also studied in ways that are not about measuring with a scale. Researchers will often interview subjects, or ask questions in focus groups, or observe behaviors to understand underlying opinions, reasons, and motivations for human behavior. A recent study into the role of trust in the 2016 election went far beyond the polling question of whom do you trust and investigated what drove people to trust each candidate. But we can know by more than empirical ways or probability ways. We also develop knowledge through our interaction with the humanities. When we read a poem or a novel or watch a film or observe a piece of art, we connect with questions we didn't even know we had. Here's an example from art. I am neither an art critic nor the son of an art critic, but when I saw this painting for the first time at the Kimball Art Museum, I was awestruck. Look at this painting with me for a moment. In Kayabat's 1877 painting, we can't see their faces, but there are three people of different classes. One of the men is a worker, 
one is a middle class person, and the one we can see the most is aristocratic. In this painting, Kabayat is challenging the viewer to ask questions about class and what will happen to class in this new industrial age. We, 150 years on the other side of the Industrial Revolution, are forced to ask questions too, with a very different perspective. How did social and economic class redefine themselves through the industrial and information periods? What changes have we experienced? We know some of the answers to Kayabat's questions, but we also have new questions because of those answers. So, depending upon the kinds of knowledge we intend to discover, we may use different methods. Thermometers are not great tools for discovering knowledge in paintings or literature, but they are excellent for measuring the temperature of water. In the same way, we may not use qualitative forms of research in the natural sciences when they are very useful in the social sciences. The humanities force us to discover knowledge and truths in ways that we didn't even expect to be looking. We use different approaches to discover different forms of knowledge. Your discussion and assignment this week is to explore your own major, or if you don't have one, what you think your major might be and how knowledge is discovered in that field. Start with the three broad categories, natural sciences, social sciences, or the humanities. How is knowledge discovered? What are some of the criteria of justification that help wade through the confusion and the uncertainty? And like my own confidence walking down that jetway to the plane, what leads you to rely upon the belief that certain things are true within your intended discipline?